Good evening, everyone. Before we begin tonight, I just have a question to pose to you. And depending on the response, will determine how quickly I have to go tonight. As I was putting the program together, I realized that the scope of the topic is so vast and so great that I really could benefit from a little bit more time to really get into what I want to communicate with you with, with regard to our spiritual selves. So my question is, rather than rush through tonight, how many here would be willing to come back again next week should I need a little bit more time to finish the treatment? Okay, great, thank you. I mentioned last week that the Psalms are an excellent source of trying to unfold our relationship with God. The Psalms are a very real, authentic expression of a person's search for their creator. If you read them and then study them, you realize that they wrestle with the very stuff of life. They peel away at all of the superficial things that can sometimes come into our world and get at the essence of what it means to be a human being, living and interacting in a world with a profound faith in their God. The Psalms presume that one is in search of some kind of a relationship with this God who created them. And so you hear, especially in Psalm 42, a very vivid, very real search for God. Imagery such as this. As a deer longs for running streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. You can, just in that one little verse, when you reflect and meditate upon it, really get a sense of what it means to be thirsty and how a human being, when they are thirsty, really reaches out and searches for that which can quench their thirst. And so it is with our spiritual life and our relationship with God. Our soul, our inner being, reaches out and searches for this relationship with our Creator. Psalm 139 opens up a wonderful reflection on where God is in our life and how abundant His presence is around us. O oh God, you search me and you know me. You know my thoughts from afar. That God has an inner connection with us as our soulmate who journeys with us in all the events of our lives. A very beautiful, beautiful reflection that puts us immediately in touch with a God who is everywhere. The Psalms. They're always worthy of a read. They're worthy of pursuing and investigating, and they're an excellent source right before us in Scripture where we can go and tap into a pathway to our God. Last week, we talked a little bit about Lexio Divina, that Benedictine spirituality that has the four moments to it, the reading of scripture, the meditation and reflection upon scripture, the praying with the fruit of that meditation, and then contemplation. It's a very beautiful prayer form. And when you leave tonight, thank you to the swift research of Evelyn Kiley, I have a handout for you that is a very simple, easy guide to how you can do this at home. 
I do want to emphasize, however, that the process of Lexio Divina does not need to be accomplished in one sitting. And this is a misconstrued conception that people sometimes bring to the practice. They feel that they need to create this chunk of time in their life, that they have to create the prayer space. And as you read through the instructions for Lexio Divina, that is indeed the ideal way to do it, to kind of calm oneself down and prepare oneself to read the scripture, reflect and meditate upon it, pray upon the meditation, and then contemplate the presence of God. But in our busy schedules, that's not always possible. So there is a form of Lexio Divina that you can do even when you're at work. If you get up in the morning, for example, and you read a passage of scripture or you pick up a particular psalm that's speaking to you and you read that through and you keep it in your head during the day, as you're doing your stuff at work and as your mind begins to search for things to think about and meditate upon, you can always go back and use that resource to keep within you. Or playing a tape of scripture on the way to work allows you to listen to the word of God, and then that word can stay with you during the day, and you can refer back on it in your reflections. So Lexio Divina can be divided up over time, because that contemplative piece, the final piece, is something that we don't do, but something that God does in and through us. We mentioned last time, contemplation is a gift from God. He alone can draw us to himself. We can't do that for ourselves. We can just open the space to allow God to work, but then God carries us the rest of the way. Well, that contemplative moment, I could read Psalm 42 today. I can meditate upon it, reflect upon it, get a sense of what it's saying and how it relates to my life. I can voice my supplications and my prayers to God based on that reflection. But three or four days from now, I may develop an insight or I may see something that sheds new light on a whole aspect of where that psalm was leading me two days before. You see, God may use time to teach us lessons on his own terms and not necessarily on ours. We also said last week that a big part of understanding prayer is realizing that God knows what we need even before we ask him. And so that our job in prayer is really work. Work not to convince God of anything, but work to create the field the disposition, the cultivated soil, so to speak, that will allow God to then use us and us to then be able to understand ourselves so that we can clear away the clutter of our own lives to open the pathway of love of our Creator. Our prayer of petition, then, is not to convince God of our needs or to slam the doors of heaven and think that the louder I cry, the more I'm going to be attended to, the purpose of our petitionary prayer is dialogue of relationship. As I mentioned last week, in your own relationships with your spouses, your children, your friends, if you don't voice your opinions, if you don't voice your feelings, if you don't have a communicative relationship, you can have love in your heart to the nth degree, but the object of your love is not going to understand it completely. And so it is with God. Vocal prayer is extremely important to establish that human relationship with God because we are bound by our humanity. We cannot become angels and we're not divine. And God doesn't expect us to relate to him in any other way other than our limited human self. And so we are verbal beings. And so extending the thoughts of our heart verbally to God is an important part of our spirituality and lays the groundwork of relationship. 
and when you really stop and think about it, speaks of our profound belief that there is that supreme one on the other end of our vocalizations. The first order of business tonight that I would like to accomplish, or at least attempt to accomplish, is opening up the pathway a little bit <clears throat> to our understanding of God. Before I even get into some of the things in that book I referenced last week, The Cloud of Unknowing, I'd like to, first of all, talk about who God is a bit and who God is not. And I also mentioned last week that we really can't use our minds to understand God. God is beyond the comprehension of thought. The only way we can approach God is through the virtue of love. How we understand the object of our love is going to then determine how we approach and relate to him. I'd like to begin that observation and discussion by looking at a common phrase we use. I referenced it last week and promised to return to it, and I want to do that now. The phrase is God's will. God's will. We hear it thrown around all the time. Our petitions at church always end with, according to your will. The primary prayer that we say, the Our Father, thy will be done. Sometimes in life, we go through a very difficult time and find ourselves forced from this place to here against our own will. And we sometimes rationalize and try to make sense of that by saying, that must have been God's will. I have to accept it as God's will. There is a big problem with this terminology and an even bigger problem with our understanding of the terminology. And I'd like to take some time tonight, right at the get-go, to break open that discussion a bit and to explain why there's a problem with the terminology and what a truer understanding of God's will really is all about. God does not offer us a game of trying to understand some elusive divine plan that he has in place. So in other words, it's not trying to figure something out. You know, God has the blueprint. And now somehow in this blueprint, I got to figure out how to play out my life. And if I move my life in the right way, then I'm working in accordance with God's will. If I step out of check, then I'm out of sync with God's will. That somehow in the big mix of things, there's this grand design that has to somehow mysteriously unfold. And as the pieces of life go in and out, we justify the flow and the tide of those pieces based on whether they may mirror or fit into this divine plan. Number one, stop thinking like that. Stop thinking like that. God's will has nothing to do with this elusive divine plan that has to be unfolded. We often hear the phrase, God does not give us more than we can carry. We use this to sometimes help us understand how we can even possibly carry a very heavy burden in life. And somehow, if we convince ourselves that God has given us this, then somehow it's going to make that burden lighter to carry. Number two, stop thinking like that. Stop thinking like that. God does not give us burdens. He doesn't place roadblocks in front of our life. That's not the way God operates. And that's not the way God works. 
We are not puppets on a string trying to do the will of the one who's controlling those strings. God doesn't override our free will, but he use, allows us to use that free will. God doesn't cause disasters. He doesn't cause difficult fates in life. And the big thing is God doesn't take people from here because he has a bigger purpose for them in heaven. Stop thinking like that. God does not do that. He has no need to do that, which we're going to see in a moment. So if God doesn't treat us as puppets on a string, and there's no predestined plan into which we're supposed to fit, including the end of our days, because we often hear that, oh, the days of your life are numbered. When your time is up, it's up. Stop thinking like that. Then what is God's will? And what does that mean? Well, let's look at it from a philosophical, theological point of view. And I'm going to get a little heady here for a minute, but it's important to get the terms straight, and then I'll step back and put them in more practical terms. When we say that God is a personal being, we mean that he is intelligent, he's free, and he is distinct from and a part of this world. Okay, he's intelligent, he's free, he is distinct from and a part of this world. He is freedom and intelligence to the nth most perfect degree. Our highest perfections, what we can achieve the most of, is intellect and will. I can think and I can will my actions based on what I think. So if I want to go from here over to there, I can think that and my will carries it. And that's how human beings function. With God, those distinctions do not exist. For God, his intellect and his will are all one and the same. All one and the same. And so when you push it back, what is God's will? In essence, the answer to that question is God himself. Think about that for just a moment. God's will is none other than God himself, his essence, his essence. His own infinite goodness is his will. So if no creature was ever created, God would still be the same and, it's, and as sufficient as he is now. Okay, think about that. If no creature was ever created, God would be the same and as sufficient as he is now. And this is solid, good Catholic theology. The Vatican Council speaks of it in this way. God is most happy in and by himself. Most happy in and by himself. It doesn't mean that he doesn't wish our good, but he has no need of us and is not dependent on us for his happiness. Think about that for a minute. He is not dependent upon us for his happiness. So God doesn't care whether we cooperate with some plan. It's not his issue. Think of it in human terms. Myself, if I love you, and I will to love you, I'm going to need something from you to reflect that love. God doesn't need that. All God needs to do is love. So God's will, then, is his infinite goodness, the essence of his being. So when you hear the term God's will, 
think God's essence, God's infinite goodness. Thy will be done, that God's infinite goodness, God's essence, be realized here on earth. Do you see the difference in the understanding of that term? Big difference, big difference. So therefore, if we put it into a question, what does God want? What does God want? The answer, get ready, app, Absolutely nothing. Nothing. What does God want? Absolutely nothing. Other than that, which flows naturally and divinely from pure love. Pure love. Other than that, which flows naturally and divinely from pure love. The virtues, such as justice and fortitude, salvation, goodness, wholeness. Because to want something means that I lack something. If I lack something, it means I'm not perfect. And God is perfect. So how can he lack anything? He doesn't. God does not need anything in order for God to be happy as God. We need to begin to just how we think about our divine creator. God creates us out of love because love is the essence of God, perfected to the 100th degree, pure, perfect love. He creates us out of love. Our creation, our self, flows from that gift of love. And all of the goodness and all the specialness that comes with that. As I mentioned, the virtues, justice, fortitude, peace, goodness, compassion, mercy. All of that flows forth in the goodness and the wonder of the creation of you. You cooperate with God's will every time you tap into those kinds of resources. When you begin to live your life in accord with the divine goodness. When you begin to open the door in your own very small, little existence for God's goodness to flow in and through you and become a part of who you are as a person. That's how you do God's will. But see, we do things with that. And we tend to think that I have to somehow intuit to go from A to B. Is it God's will that I do that? And so then I pray. Mm, God, is your will? No. I don't know. Am I listening to me? Or am I listening to him? Where do I search for the voice? Whereas the question isn't, should I move from A to B? The question is, how can I open the door to experiencing the infinite goodness of God more than I am now? How can I open the door to that wellspring of love that abounds all over the place and created me in the first place? That's the question to be answered. 
And that's why spiritual directors exist. Spiritual directors help people put the pieces together in their life and what we call in the spiritual world, discern where in the mix of everything is God's call or God's essence or God's will. Because sometimes we can't see that ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish whether we're listening to our own voice or whether it's the voice of the divine. But a good gauge of that is what, we're, is what we're listening to, is what we're hearing, reflecting back on love, reflecting back on goodness, bringing me further into my relationship with God? Or is what I'm listening to purely self-motivated and self-serving? If it's self-motivated and self-serving, then pretty good chance it ain't coming from God. If it's freeing, open, and returning to love, then it probably is coming from God. This is a, a big twist, perhaps, on how you're commonly used to dealing with these kinds of things, but we need to get these things squared before we move further in an understanding of the spiritual life. If we don't know who it is we're trying to open ourselves to, then we need to correct that vision. If I expect you to be one person and I get to know you and you turn out to be somebody totally different, well, now I got to adjust. Well, same thing with God. Same thing with God. Sometimes we start out with an immature relationship or idea with God. And as we grow through life, we have to fine-tune that and adjust it as we continue this, this journey, that's one of the other beauties of the Psalms. You read the Psalms, you see people growing in their relationship with God. They change their image and their understanding as they go along. Let me give a contemporary example of how we sometimes get into the trap of what we can call spiritualizing things. In other words, taking something human and giving it a divine twist without it actually coming from God. You know, we've, been, we've had chain letters, you know, through most of our lives. You know, most of us grow up, and we, I even remember my mother getting the chain letters in the mail. And I'd see it on the counter there, and then in those days, writing out by hand. Now, what are you doing? I gotta send this to nine people. Otherwise, something bad's going to happen. So she dutifully write out the chain letter, get the nine stamps, of course, two or three cents in those days for a stamp, put the thing on there and mail them out, and she'd feel good. Great. No more voodoo curse. I'm all right. <laughs> House burnt down the next day, but she's fine. She's fine. <laughs> well, we're still doing that. Now we've got the convenient email approach. Right? Things like this. I got this a long time ago, but I'm sure it's still going around. A very common one. Sent an angel to watch over you last night, but it came back. I asked why. The angel said, angels don't watch over angels. Twenty angels are in your world. Ten of them are sleeping. Nine are playing. One is reading this message. Please read, not joking. God has seen you struggling with something. Okay, it's a valid thing. God says it's over. A blessing is coming your way. If you believe in God, send this message on. Please don't ignore it. You are being tested. <laughs> God is going to fix two big things tonight in your favor. If you believe in God, drop everything and pass it on. Tomorrow will be the best day ever. Send this to, uh, to 20 friends, including me, and if I don't get it back, I guess you're not one of them. <laughs> so now we've got the, the wedge with God, and now I'm done with the person who sent me this, okay? <laughs> as soon as you get five replies, someone you love will quietly surprise you. Well, love tends to surprise, so the chances are that somebody in my life is going to surprise me. It's pretty good, okay? But the point is... Listen to the spirituality behind this, okay? 
these types of things are innocent in one sense. In other words, they're trying to convey sentiment. I'm thinking of you today, basically is what's in here. I'm concerned about your well-being. That's in here. Life gives you lemons, make lemonade. That's in here. But to communicate those human sentiments, which are true sentiments, we use God and turn God into something that he's not. And so we need to be very careful in terms of how we not only approach God, but how we communicate about God. Because we must remember what we started out with last time, our minds can't comprehend God. So we have to make sure in our thinking about God that we stay close to the source. And what's the source? Scripture. Scripture, inspired word, tells us about God as God reveals God's self throughout history. The teachings of the church attempt to preserve an image of God through God's revelation throughout history. The mass, the sacraments, all point us to an image of God that is true. If you look at all of those sources, you don't see images of God like this in here. God always comes through scripture, the mass, and the sacraments as this free, loving, beneficent, wonderful human being. We make him vindictive, judgmental, harsh, rigid, and nasty. So we have to be careful in terms of what we do, in terms of our perception of God. So that brings us then to another interesting piece. We kind of touched on it, but I want to use the words because it's important to use the words. Providence and predestination. Providence and predestination. Let's look at those for just a minute. Theologically, providence may be defined as the scheme in the divine mind by which all things are treated, all things treated are ordered and guided efficiently to their common end or purpose. So in other words, basically God's plan for creation and the plan that that created world takes out. So for example, the seasons and their changing are a part of God's providence, okay? He set it up to work that way, okay? The way the moon sh uh, shines and the way things rotate in the universe and how one thing is here and another is there is a part of God's providence, the way he set things out. The fact that we are finite, limited human beings are a part of God's providence. And even the fact that we age and we get older is a part of God's providence. It's the order of things. It's how things are designed to be carried out. So that, I think, is, is pretty simple enough to understand. The entire universe is ruled, clearly follows from the fact that God is the author of all things and that order and purpose must characterize the action of the intelligent creator. So, for example, there's a purpose to all things and that purpose is contained in the intelligence of the creator who designed it. We see that very clearly in the sixth chapter of Matthew, verse 26. Very familiar passage. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap. They gather nothing into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more important than they? So is this sense that God is not distant from creation, but God is a part of it. That God, through providence, has placed an order, a structure, and a design to the created world, through the created world. So when we act in accord with that design, we act in accord with the providence of God. Providence of God. So predestination, just to clarify that point again, the only thing predestined, really, is the order of things, not the events as they unfold. And it's got, we have to be clear on this theological point because it has spiritual ramifications. 
What is predestined is the order, not the unfolding of events. Because we have this wonderful gift that God gives us. And it's what defines us as human beings. It separates us from animals and plants. It's called reason and free will. You see, we can say yes and we can say no. And that's necessary. It's necessary to be built into the whole mix. Because if I want you to love me and I force you to love me, then your love is no longer free. It's no longer free because I've made you love me. I put conditions down that would force you to love me. God doesn't do that. God gives us the absolute ability to say yes or no. He creates an order to things which we can comply with or we don't have to comply with. We can work in conjunction with that order or we don't have to. God tells us he created us. He's infinitely good. And all the virtues and the love and the powers that can flow from that infinite goodness can be ours. But you don't have to accept it. In other words, you don't have to live in accord with that divine will. Do you hurt God? No. Because what? guess what? God can't be hurt because he doesn't need you to do anything. He doesn't need you to do anything. Because he's perfect and doesn't need you to complete him. But he wants you because he loves you. And that's different. That's different. So then what does it mean to please God? We hear that word. Okay? I think we've clarified a little bit what the divine will means. I think we've gotten a little bit of a handle on predestination and providence, but what does it mean to please God? If God doesn't need me to do anything, then why do I have to please him? Well, here's another bonus answer. You don't. You don't. But you want to, and I'll tell you why. If I love someone... And that being, that person, is someone I desire to be with. And I desire to know. And I desire to be close to. That I'm going to do things and act in a way that brings me closer to that person. Their happiness, metaphorically, is going to be my concern. The essence of their being is going to some, be something I want to conform my being to. Think about your spouse. Think about a close friend. Think about a son or daughter. True love draws people together and beckons forth behaviors that speak of that relationship of love. So when you're attentive to your spouse, or if you're attentive to your son or daughter, or you're attentive to a close friend, then you're going to want to do things to express that love and please them. And so therefore, pleasing God, when you boil it all down, doesn't mean doing things in specific order or at a specific time. It means conforming my life as much as possible to the infinite goodness of God and living out the way I choose, the way I live, the way I think in accord with that. It means living in accord with the divine providential plan that is placed out, the order of things. When we get into the Englishman and his unfolding of spirituality, you'll see this even more clearly. So basically, prayer is the way we tap into the divine essence. Prayer is the way we internalize the love that God offers to us. Because a relationship of prayer with God 
is the expression and love of love and desire for God's presence. Think about that for just a moment. A relationship of prayer with God is the expression of love and desire for God's presence, or we use the word essence. It is empty of personal interest or gain. That is very big to understand. Empty of personal interest or gain. So in other words, I don't go to God in prayer to have God solve my problem. I go to God in prayer because of my desire to love God and to express that desire to him. If you read the Psalms, you see this abounding all over the place. If you look at the way Jesus prayed, you see this all over the place. Jesus goes into the desert primarily to reconnect, to just put that plug in and reconnect with his Father, not necessarily to get something out of it. Even his verbalization of his agony in the garden wasn't done with a knowledge of changing God's mind about the cross that was awaiting him. He verbalized how he was feeling as a human being, which we all have a right to do, which is really, when you stop and think about it, an expression of love. If you're facing a struggle, you're going to go to the object of your love and verbalize that struggle. You're going to cry. You're going to express the deepest sentiments of your heart because that's what you do in a relationship that means the most. We don't go to God in prayer necessarily to receive favors or to receive any satisfaction. Ultimately, we go without personal interest or gain. The... Englishman describes prayer this way. And it's, and it's a definition of prayer that has stood the test of time and has been picked up and reworked and redefined, but in essence has remained the same for centuries. Prayer is a reverent, conscious openness to God, full of the desire to grow in goodness and overcome evil or sin. Listen again. Prayer is a reverent, conscious openness to God, full of the desire to grow in goodness and overcome evil or sin. He says, we must pray with all the intensity of our being in its height and depth and length and breath. We must pray with all the intensity of our being in its height and depth and length and breath. Now here's the surprising twist. And not with many words, but in a little word of one syllable. Think about that for just a moment. And not with many words, but in a little word of one syllable. So in other words, he says, we don't have to use a lot of words to go to God. And that praying is a reverent, conscious expression of our desire for God. And our love of God. It doesn't have to be complicated. And it doesn't have to be long. And I'm going to read you in a moment a wonderful analogy he uses, which will put this into perspective for you very nicely. But think even of Jesus' instructions on prayer. How much simpler can you get? Jesus, teach us how to pray. Okay? First, go to your room. Two, close the door. Three, Pray to your Father in private. Doesn't take much. 
And the Our Father is probably the simplest prayer we ever have. From beginning to end, it expresses it all. Expresses it all. Nothing complicated, nothing lengthy. Doesn't stay, stay, he doesn't say to the disciples, stay in there for four days. All you have to do is go to your room, close the door, and talk. What's the Englishman say? This is a great analogy. <clears throat> he says, let me illustrate what I am saying with another example. Imagine that in the dead of night, you heard your worst enemy, listen to that, your worst enemy, cry out with his whole being, help or fire. Even though this man were your enemy, would you not be moved to compassion by the agony of that cry and rush to help him? Yes, of course you would. And though it were in the dead of winter, you would still hasten to quench the fire or calm his distress. So he says, your worst enemy cries out help or fire in the middle of the night in the worst of conditions. You will still go and help that person to whatever extent you're able to do. He says, my God, if grace can so transform a mere man to where he forget his hatred and have such compassion for his enemy, what shall we not expect from God when he hears a person cry out to him from the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of his whole being? For by nature, God is the fullness of all that we are by participation. God's mercy belongs to the essence of his being. That is why we say he is all merciful. Surely then we can confidently hope in him. The bottom line to that little analogy is this. By our creation, by the very fact of who we are, we already, before we do anything, have this tremendously wonderful relationship with our Creator. We're connected. Connected. More so than you're connected to your spouse, more so than you're connected to one of your kids, more so than you can be connected to anything or anyone. We have a connection to our Creator. And it's in here. It's in here. So in prayer, if we get ourselves to the point where we, in all sincerity and in all honesty and with the deepest amount of fervor we have and cry out to that God, he's going to listen. He's going to listen. And he's going to respond to that prayer. Not like a puff of magic, but through the very doorway that we use to connect to him in the first place, that deep, resource of soul. And he's going to use virtue, love, fortitude, and courage. If you're struggling with your life and you're afraid of what the future is, cry out to God and you will receive the courage to move on. If you truly believe that God has blessed you abundantly with gifts and talents, then you can, with your relationship with God in hand, confront anything. Anything. If your mind and heart are fo focused on a relationship with your Creator, and that's all that matters to you, then what do you care what happens in your life over here? Birds do their thing without a care. And they survive each day. We get so worried about the particulars of our life because you know what? When you step back and you would say, why is this bothering me? 
Well, you know what? Most times, at least in my own life, because I can't control it. It's defying my control. That blasted computer that crashes every five minutes, that gets me in the gut of who I am and causes me to go all off, is something that's defying my control. But even the bigger issues of life, I get sick, I have cancer, I've been told I'm going to, to die. That bothers me because I can't control it. It bothers the one who loves me because they can't control it. If I find myself addicted to a substance or something of that nature, usually the frustration stems from my inability to control it. And so therefore, we need to step back in our relationship with God and see life as he sees it. The fact of the matter is, we can look at ourselves in many different ways. And people will often say, well, show me proof of God. You know, how do we know that God exists? There's nothing. What, this flesh and blood, you know, it's an organism. I can function without God. If we step back, is that really true? Because if we look at life, putting our reason on hold for a minute, and using the virtue of love, which say what you want about the virtue of love, where it comes from and what it means. I say it comes from God. Somebody who doesn't believe in God could say it's just a part of human nature. We have an affinity and an orientation toward the eternal. Listen to that. We have an affinity and an orientation toward the eternal. It exists within us. What does this mean? Thinking about aging for a minute. This is a wonderful little analogy. We all love to age. I've often said it, I think I mentioned it in a couple of sermons. You know, aging is God's biggest joke because you go to bed one night, everything looks good. You wake up in the morning, you think you're looking at the same face you looked at in the mirror the night before. Nothing has changed and you go on like this, day after day, year after year. And somebody pulls out a picture of you 10 years ago and you look at it and you say, who the heck is that? When did this joke happen? I didn't see it. You know, so aging can be funny if you think about it, or it can be our worst curse. And what happens with the aging process? And if you talk to people who are growing old gracefully, this is what I hear anyway, and maybe I'm very wrong, but this is my impression of it. The body begins to go through its wonderful little changes. All well and good. Somehow in the mix of life, the knees lock up, you end up with back problems, you're going to more doctors than you are not, you now need glasses, things are growing where they're not supposed to be growing. <laughs> and we go through this wonderful little thing called aging. And how we process this is largely determined upon our minds in how we think about this aging process. So if we come to life with a little bit more negative attitude, the first time something doesn't work, it's going to be, oh, for crying out loud, I'm getting old, I can't do anything anymore, you know, life is miserable, God take me in my sleep, you know, it's the whole litany of woes because we're confronting the fact that our body doesn't function the way it goes. But there's a piece to that aging uh, process which is interesting. We focus on the physical and even the mental. Oh, I can't remember things anymore. I got more notes and lists than I've ever had in my entire life. You tell me something today, you see me tomorrow and you say, remember when I told you that, Father? No clue. None. 
All right? So mentally and physically, we're very much aware of the fact that things are going not where we want them to go. And we're not getting better. We're slowly going back. Okay? Except for one part. Do you ever notice your heart doesn't age? At least not your physical one? Talk to a friend of mine. She's going to be, she is 101. 101. Still goes out to dinner, still strong. If you were at my anniversary mass, you met her. She was sitting up here. She says to me, I don't feel old. Amy, stop jumping on top of the chair to get to the top cabinet. You're 101 years old. You're going to fall and break something. I don't feel old. You talk to her. She knows more about life than you can find in any textbook. She's lived more of it than anybody else that I know of and can still communicate and talk like that. Is she old? I don't think so. Because the body's aging, the mind, well, not in her case, but in most cases, the mind goes. But we develop something in here. See, when you learn life's lessons and you live life well, and you've suffered, and you've taken your knocks, you develop a disposition of heart, we can call it wisdom, that doesn't decline with age, but it gets better. It can be said, if you live life well, that as you get older, you learn to love better. Because you've learned by life experience what love is, and what love is not. So it stands to reason that someone who is older doesn't feel old. If you took away the bones that don't feel as limber as they used to, the ache in the back, the mind that forgets more than it remembers, take away the eyes that need correction, take away the hair that fell out, Take away all of that stuff. Do you really feel that old inside? I know I don't. And when I hear people talk, they don't either. Because we're not made for this world. This world is meant to be shed away. We are meant for something else. Because... Regardless of when and how we leave this world, whatever condition our body is in, it's going to go away anyway. Whatever condition our mind is in, you think you're forgetting now? In death, forget about it. It's done. Except one part. Your soul. Your essence. Your heart. All those lessons you learned about life, there's your investment for eternity. And if we were not meant to be eternal, then what purpose does wisdom and the greater capacity for love serve at all? None. We don't need it to survive, at least not humanly. And we don't even need it to be considered human by secular terms. So we are programmed, wired, to find a certain amount of happiness in this life and move on to the one to come. So basically, the order of business is the accumulation of wisdom and the feeling of living are really matters of the heart. There is an eternal quality to this that transcends our bodies and our minds. Our experiential knowledge does not decline with age and can actually improve through the accumulation of wisdom. Hence, a 100-year-old full of life can still feel not old. It is who we become interiorly that meets the eternal presence of God and then lives forever. It's the fact that we can grow and develop interiorly that speaks of the eternity that waits. 
The only thing that causes us to not want to live are the limitations of this life. If we remove those limitations, who wouldn't want to live forever? I'll see you next week. You can stand, take a little break. We'll come together and pray as we did last week. If I don't get a chance to tell you, uh, remind you again, you do have the Lexio Divina uh, forms here. Uh, next week, we'll get into uh, the mind of, and the heart of um, the Englishman a little bit more and unfold a little bit about what it means to relate to God in a very simple, simple spirit of prayer. And I think you'll find that kind of interesting to pursue. But thank you very much. And as you're stretching, make sure you have a, a copy of the evening prayer that we're going to use tonight. And again, if you were here last week, you know this already. If not, this is new. The Psalms are done side to side. I will be on this side. So this side of the church is part A. This side of the church is part B. And I think the rest on that sheet is pretty self-explanatory.